There's a musician, another one works over for Pacific Daily News, and another one uh, works over for a state agency in Spokane, California. Uh, I'm running on a platform of keeping Guam safe uh, as a community. I'm a retired chief of police. I also was the director of Veterans Affairs, and I want to take care of our veterans. But to keep Guam safe, my main emphasis is to make sure we increase police presence in our communities. Some of that are the volunteers, the CAPE and the police reserves. And then I want to look at the situation, the threat of drug and substance abuse in our island. You can't just do it by enforcement. You've got to do treatment and education of our youth. And then what I want to do is look at the small businesses. Uh, I have a lot of family members and relatives, friends, and supporters who are struggling with their small businesses. And what I want to do is stand up an advocacy group. And that's the area of concentration I'm going to do. Uh, I also want to make sure that we diversify the economy. So. My son being a musician, some of the things is looking at the film industry and musicians that showcase that with the world. Um, my parents, Fred Verdali is an attorney, my mom is a nurse, they both passed away, and I think they've given me the blessing to always have service, public service. I have a former veteran with the Marine Corps, a former veteran with the Army Reserve and Navy Reserves. Uh, so even with the military veterans too, that's an area I want to look at. Even as a former director of veterans, I think one of the things is to make sure that we give a chance for our veterans to get into the job market and work and also thrive as a, as a business entrepreneurs. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Yeah, I, I'm Duncan McCulley, and we've got some questions. Okay, two minutes. <laughs> So, that was a good introduction. So, um, let's see. So, you know, what platform will you absolutely get completed while in office uh, and explain how you will get it done? Okay, as I said, I think the concentration is getting more police presence because the more you have police presence in our neighborhoods and our villages and not there, the more that deters criminal activity. We've seen in the news a couple of stuff that's going on, the burglaries of GDOE, the schools. We see individuals, even a couple of my supporters and some organizations I have have their house burglarized. Everything is connected and a nexus to drugs. I think that it's uh, that uh, the Guam Police Department in the past three and a half to four years have lost over 60 to 70 police officers. I got a briefing from Colonel uh, or Acting Police Commander Manny Chong, and they're down to about 250. When I left the force and retired, we had 342. We even uh, full-time officers. We even had about 100 reserves. Now you have only down to less than 11 police reserves that are active in the force. And that's the area I think that is viable to make sure that when I talk to a lot of the law enforcement directors, we get them engaged to getting individuals who want to join the Guam Police Department as volunteers. If you look at some of the volunteers I recruited when I was chief of police in my four and a half years I was chief, some of them come from all over the place. There was a bus driver, there was an individual from the military uh, who was a uh, National Guard members or Army Reserves who don't have a job. That, so that I believe is going to be uh, a viable for me in, in my first term uh, in the 37th Guam State to get a police reserve program up and, and also volunteer law enforcement. Uh, for not only just GPD, but all the other agencies. Park and rent can have park ranger reserves. Customs don't have a reserve program. We get that in our Port Authority of Police. Thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, let's see. This is a three-part question on political status. If a plebiscite was held to determine our desired political status, one, who should be allowed to vote? And two, what political status do you prefer, independent statehood, free, free, free association, and should status quo be one of those options? So if you can answer all three of those. Okay, thank you for that question. I come from a family that is, uh, has been uh, very uh, well involved uh, from my Uncle Ricky uh, Berdalio, uh, to, uh, who was former governor, to my Uncle Robert Underwood 
who was an OPIR uh, way back during the uh, 70s. And one of the things I feel as a, uh, from listening to the conversations around the family table is that uh, there certainly should be some political status change. We need to be a very strong partner with America. And there's three areas there. Uh, there's statehood, uh, there's free association, and then there's independence. I'm certainly not for independence because, you know, I value the, the passport, the American passport that have the U.S. I served in the military, and I think I want to be closer to the United States of America, you know, in, in terms of the, any political status change. For the vote on that, there was a decolonization, uh, there was a, a, um, a registry that has individuals who would be, uh, and I think, the former speaker, Ben Panglin, and had that. I think one of the things is who would be able to participate in our respect that that, that whoever's in that uh, uh, registry, I think there's two morals and it was defined as them seeking, uh, you know, their uh, a political status change and decolonization process. And I will respect that that's the only thing I'll take. And I think the third part of that question is, I already mentioned, I think uh, the three, and I would more, I'm looking closely more at free association. But there's another area that was really something else on Commonwealth and mutual consent, and that's an area I think that I want to uh, do. It's a very complex process, and I know with America today, with the spirit that they have, uh, and what they did with Puerto Rico, and what they've done with uh, uh, the other uh, uh, Northern Marianas, I think it's just viable that this conversation will continue as an important issue. Thank you. Okay. Are you in favor of a part-time legislature? Why or why not? Okay, uh, um, I've heard some of the debates and I've read a lot of the research on when it comes down to part-time and I've actually talked to a lot of constituents and I said, if you were to call my office as a senator and then they were to, and they were to say, I'm sorry, Senator Bergali wasn't in his office, he's over at his plumbing business or he's working over with uh, his other company, uh, I think, uh, um, uh, there would be resistance to that. I think they, uh, people, um, most of my constituent supporters want me to uh, be full-time as a, as a senator in the Obama administration. And I've heard the research back and forth. You know, it used to be a part-time legislature. Well, that was way back, I think, in the 1900s, the early 1900s. It's now 2022. There are a lot more complex uh, responsibilities that the Guam legislature has. Actually, three functions. One, balance of power. Two, work with your, cons uh, your constituents. And the part party politics stops there. And the third one, of course, is making laws. And you can't rush it when it comes down to making laws because this impacts every one of our lives. So I'm not for part-time uh, uh, legislature for, for the 37 or even beyond. I, would, I think we have a case and build a case to say that those that are uh, sometimes would suggest that a part-time legislature uh, may not see the threat of weakening the legislature in terms of its balance of power with the executive branch, which is becoming so powerful, and the judiciary also, which is the third branch of government. Uh, thank you. All right. So this will be your last question. What's your stand on the proposed Guam Heartbeat Act of 2022, which it we know it's modeled on the text, recent Texas law, which substantially prohibit abortions and encourages enforcement through private lawsuits. Okay. Well, this is my stance right now. I am an uh, uh, advocate of pro-choice. I believe in the rights of women to make their personal decisions. I find it concerning too that the government uh, would have such power uh, between a woman and their physician when they're inside a, uh, you know, inside the doctor's office and what kind of decision a woman would have to make. Um, uh, life has always been sacred to me too, you know, uh, and, uh, and uh, I, I lived with a mom who was very religious, she was a nurse, and she uh, uh, was very religious in, in, in terms of some of the things, but I think one thing about my mom, despite that religious, I think she passed down the values of all of 11 of us and my siblings that you make the, that you you look at uh, situations where you know uh, a doctor and a, and, a, and a woman's physician you know and, and uh, the potential for control and uh, these are the kind of aspects I got that from from my mom I also got it from my dad who was a lawyer who said there are a lot of uh, um, rights that are being developed among women they come a long way uh, and uh, some of that, of course, is making their own personal decisions with a medical situation that they have. Someone said that 
uh, abortion, uh, so then you're pro-abortion. No, it's pro-choice, okay? It's not pro-abortion. I don't think any 16-year-old or 14-year-old wants uh, to be a pro-abortionist. And I think when they find themselves in that situation, I can't see them being charged for a crime of murder too, because sometimes that's an emotional word to use for a 14-year-old or a 15-year-old who may find themselves in a situation to have a baby then be accused to be a murderer. I've seen murders as a police officer, believe me, and I can tell the, dis the distinction in that. Thank you. Well, thank you. Those are your four questions. Yeah. Thank you, thank you. <laughs>